Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net, where I teach beginners the skills that they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. In this lesson, we're going to talk about arrays. Now, previously, I compared a variable to a bucket in the computer's memory that holds a value. Now, to extend that analogy a little bit, fur uh, a little bit further, you can think of an array as a bucket that contains other buckets, okay? Uh, another way to think of an array is that it's a sequence of data. Now, I hesitate to use the word collection or sequence. Those have a certain connotation. Collections have uh, a, a definite meaning to .NET developers, but you can think of an array as a grouping or a collection of data. So you declare an array just like you would any other variable. Uh, starting with a data type and then you say how many elements or how many sub buckets how many buckets you want inside of the bigger bucket okay uh, how how large the array you want to hold uh, or your array to hold or to contain so you can access then any single item in the array uh, inside of that sequence by using its index or rather its ordinal position inside of the sequence that you want to access. So what I want to do is create a quick example of an array in action and we'll visit this example a couple of times. The first time we're going to use kind of the longhand format and then I want to show you a new shortcut as well. All right so what I want to do is create a new project so I'm going to this time we'll change it up go file new project Make sure I'm working with C Sharp templates, console application template, and we'll call this Understanding Arrays. And click OK. OK, now take note that this time I'm going to use the square brackets whenever I work with arrays, not, not the curly braces. The On your keyboard, it would be right below the curly braces, the square brackets. OK, so here we go. All right, so let's examine the declaration and the assignment of values inside of our array. First of all, you can see in line number 13, uh, we're defining an array of integers. The square brackets are used in the declaration to declare an array of type int called numbers. Then on that same line of code, we're going to define the array of integers or ints to have five values or rather five elements. Again, using the square brackets to define the number of elements that'll be in our array. So then in lines number 15 through 19, uh, we're going to be setting the individual elements of the array to an integer value. So for example, let's take a look at line number 16. Uh, I would verbalize this in one of two, oh, two or three ways. I would say number sub 1 equals the value 8, or the numbers array at index 1 equals the value 8 or possibly even the second element of the numbers array is set to the value eight, okay? So you get the idea. Any of these are acceptable nomenclature to use. Uh, it's extremely important to remember that arrays are zero based, meaning that you, account, uh, you count the element of the array starting with zero as the first element. So the first element is zero, the second element is one, 
third element is two. You've got to remember that. That is the source of so many problems for new developers. And it caught me so many times when I was first getting started uh, writing software. Uh, it's just a little bit of confusion up front, but uh, we're going to see what happens if you forget that in just a moment. Uh, also, by the way, whenever we use the square brackets in this capacity, we refer to them as the array or index access operator. Uh, it's what we're going to use throughout, throughout to access a specific element of the array. All right, so then in line number 21, we're retrieving the value that we placed into a specific element of the array. And in this case, uh, we are going to access uh, position one, or in other words, the second element, uh, and we're displaying it using a console right line statement. All right, as we learned earlier, the two string is superfluous here. We don't need it uh, because console.writeLine can accept an integer value. Uh, it'll perform the implicit data conversion necessary to print the screen. I just wanted to show that we can use the two string method because what's returned from number sub one or the second element of the array is an integer, just like any other integer. There's nothing special about it per se. So we can use or call the two string method, which we know integers have baked into it, okay? So if we run the application, what would we expect to see? Well, the number eight, because it's the second item in the array that we created. Great. All right, so what happens if we add a line of code that references a sixth element like so? Let's go ahead equals 42. All right, and let's try to run the application and whoa, uh, we get the error message, system.index out of range exception occurred in understanding arrays.exe. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue this. Um, in other words, the index was outside the bounds of the array. We're trying to stuff six items into a variable that was only designed to hold five items. So we are outside of the array. Uh, it's important to note that you cannot expand or shrink the array once it has been defined. It is immutable, all right? If you need that functionality, there are fancier alternatives to arrays that we're gonna look at later in this course called collections. Um, also, you can declare and initialize the array in a single line of code. So um, we don't have to dimension uh, the upper boundary of the array because the initialization will define that up front. So let's take a look at how to do that. I'm actually going to code. Uh, I'm going to take. Let's just do that. And we'll do this. And here I'm going to do the following. All right, so in this case, the upper boundary would be five because there are six items initialized, all right? And so we're able to, again, create a new array of type integer. And instead of declaring how many items there are, we'll just say, I don't care how many items there are. How about I just give you the list and let you figure out how many there are? And then we proceed to give it the list. When we run the application, we'll get the same result because they're still in the same order. Uh, eight is the second value, so it's uh, number sub one will get us to the second item in the array, just like before. Um, but, you know, we didn't have to take this longhand form in order to, uh, to initialize it. All right, so let's take this one step Further, we can create arrays to hold virtually any data type, not just integers. So let's create an array to store some names. So let me comment this out. I'll go ahead and get rid of the mug. Let me get rid of all. And I'm going to do the following.
Okay, and now this time I'm going to do something a little bit more interesting. We used the for iteration statement in the previous lesson. I got another one for you here. Check this out. Great. Okay. So this is virtually identical to the previous work that we've done with integers, but we're simply using string and initializing it with literal strings of names. And uh, instead of using the for iteration statement like we used previously, we're using the for each. Uh, it's much simpler, and frankly, I use this much more often because it works so well in this particular scenario. For each simply iterates through the code block once for each element in the array. So for each string inside of the names array, retrieve the value, store it in a new variable that I'm going to call name, a temporary variable called name, of type string, and then execute this line of code. Easy. All right, so let's go ahead and see it in action. We just anticipate seeing our names, the four names listed from top to bottom, and we do. Great. All right, so now we've seen how we can use four and three for each iteration statements to loop through arrays. But back to the topic of arrays, whenever you store data inside of an array, you can perform many different built-in tasks using one of the methods that are available to arrays. So just like integers or ints have built-in superpowers, like the toString or the parse method like we saw earlier, arrays have some of their own powers as well. So uh, let's comment this out. And we'll create one more example here. All right. All right, and that's one really, really long line of code. So watch what I'm going to do. All right, one line of code one string literal, but I broke it up into two pieces and used the plus operator to concatenate it back together, but put it on two different lines. So now I can just stay within a pretty narrow column of code, which I prefer. Uh, and it doesn't run off to the right hand side of the screen. Again, easy for me to read. The indentation level lets me know that it's associated with the line above it. Uh, and so it's just uh, something I wanted to demonstrate can be done, uh, and now we'll, we'll continue on. That wasn't really the point of this. All right, so here I'm using a new data type called char, which can store a single alphanumeric character as opposed to a string, which can hold an almost infinite number of characters. And then we're defining an array of chars, okay? But first we need to convert our string variable zig, which contains a famous quote from my one of my favorite people of all time, Zig Ziglar, into an array of chars. So we're going to take one big long string and we're going to chop it up into each individual letter. Each individual letter will be an element of the char array. Okay, how do we chop it up and convert it? By using the string has this built-in superpower, this built-in method called two char array. So take the full string, chop it up into individual letters. Each letter would be an element of the array and assign it to my new char array, okay? Um, and then what we wanna do is we're gonna call array.reverse and pass in this char array. What do you think that does? Well, it's gonna take each element in the, in the array and reverse its ordinal position, okay? Uh, so the first shall be last and the last shall be first, if you will. 
And then we're going to use the for each iteration statement to iterate through each char in the char array. And since I only need one line of code, I didn't need to use those curly braces uh, in, to define a code block. It just has one line. Okay. Uh, and then also, I want to make one small change here. Instead of using right line, because I don't want each of those on a separate line, I want them to line up next to each other. I'm going to get rid of the line. So I'm just going to use the right method this time so we can see the difference between right line and right. Okay. Uh, we don't want a line break in between each character fundamentally. And so now when we run the application, we can see if we're successful uh, that it prints out Zig Ziglar's famous quote backwards. You can get what you want out of life if you help enough other people get what they want. Awesome. Go ahead and end that. Okay, so in this lesson, we were primarily uh, concerned about arrays, and we learned that arrays uh, are basically a means of storing groups of data, like numbers or strings or even individual characters. And along the way, you learned uh, about a few other concepts and techniques. First of all, you declare arrays by defining the data type and adding a pair of opening and closing square brackets. You then uh, can either declare the size of the array like we did at the very beginning here, like that, or we can just give it the actual items that will be in the array in order to initialize its size and assign its values, all right? Uh, and so then you use square brackets to access individual elements of the array either to assign a value or to retrieve a value out of the array. And remember we said that arrays are always zero based and attempting to access an array element outside of that boundary like we did here, um, outside of the boundary of, of the array's length or rather the number of elements contained inside of the array will cause an exception to be thrown. We're trying to shove too much data into the bucket, so to speak, all right? and. Um, you know, we didn't do this, but we can use the length property to find out just how many elements are inside of a given array. So let me do this real quick here. Let's have a little fun. I'm going off, off uh, the uh, script a little bit because I didn't show this originally. So say I wanted to find out how many items are in my numbers array. I can print that out to screen by using the arrays length property which will give me the number of items in the array. So um, let me comment this out too. And we would expect to see how many elements? Pretty sure five, right? Yep, five, great. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, if you prefer, you can use the for each iteration statement like we did here uh, to iterate through each element in the array, which also extracts the value of each element into its own variable like we did here, okay? Uh, we can also call the array.reverse method to reverse the order, order of all the elements inside of a given array, like we did there. Uh, and um, it allows us to basically switch the ordinal position from first to last and last to first, okay? So at any rate, hopefully this was uh, uh, pretty enlightening. Arrays are great, collections are better, and we'll talk about those much later, but we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.